named Eliza, covered with scaly skin and shivering in the cold, who looked longingly at the doggy bags the senator brought back to the office each afternoon. Given some of the recent efforts in Washington to cut food stamps, which provides food for millions of struggling Americans, including millions of kids, I, I couldn't resist the urge to play with Jesus' parable and update it a little bit. And of course, that's just one way of rewriting the beginning of the parable. And I can think of other versions, too. So I'm sure that you can. <coughs> and I'm not going to finish the story, but based on the parable that Jesus just told, we can be pretty <coughs> sure that the story isn't going to end too well for that senator, unless she changes her ways. <coughs> so, my friends, why did <coughs> Jesus tell this harsh parable about the rich man and Lazarus <coughs> anyway? As I suggested to the kids, I think he did this because he was trying to teach an especially tough crowd, the hard-hearted Pharisees, whom Luke tells us in verse 14 of this very same chapter, were lovers of money. In fact, just before Jesus <coughs> launches into the parable, he minces no words in telling the Pharisees that the things that they value, wealth, power, prestige, are, quote, an abomination in the sight of God. And then Jesus goes on to tell this cautionary tale about the rich man and Lazarus to these folks who are pretending to put God first in their lives, but who, whose hearts are actually clinging to mammon, the God of wealth. Jesus tells the story because he wants them to turn back to God and to the true riches of life abundant life with God. Now just to be clear, in our parable, the rich man's sin is not that he's wealthy. His sin lies in his <coughs> indifference toward Lazarus and his attitude of superiority toward the, the poor man. Both his indifference and his attitude of superiority are, however, fueled by his great wealth which makes it possible for him to live inside of a gated community, to buy whatever he wants, to have sumptuous feasts every day, and to have power over other people. And obviously that rich man knows who Lazarus is, because when he gets to Hades, he recognizes him across the chasm, and he even refers to the poor man by name, saying, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. And a bit later, after Father Abraham has explained with some compassion that no one can cross the chasm between them, the rich man then asks Father Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to warn his brothers. Did you catch that the rich man still wants to treat Lazarus like a slave? He wants Lazarus to do his bidding, even in the afterlife. At some level, it seems that he still doesn't really quite get the great reversal of fortune that's occurred. Nor does he fully recognize his own sin. Of course, there are a couple of punchlines that come right at the end of the story. Here Jesus makes two points. Number one, leave your American Express card at home, but don't leave home without your compassion. That is to say, God calls us to be compassionate toward our neighbors and not just our family. The second thing here is that you and, and you and I, who are God's Easter people, I think understand what's go, what Jesus is foreshadowing in that very last parable, or in that very last line of the parable, rather. He's foreshadowing his own death and resurrection, as well as the way that people are going to respond to the gospel message. Some, as we know, will receive into their hearts the good news that Christ has come to reveal God's reconciling love for us, 
and their lives will be transformed by it. But sadly, others will reject God's gift of true love and abundant life and will choose instead to run after all kinds of false gods and empty promises. I don't know about you, but I can just imagine those Pharisees must have been squirming as they were listening to this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And quite frankly, I think that as, as we listen to the story, it probably makes us squirm a bit too. I mean, I'm pretty sure that we've all done what the senator in my story and what the rich man in Jesus' parable did. That is, we've walked past someone who was in need and failed to respond in a compassionate way. Sometimes we're so preoccupied with ourselves and our own problems that we don't even see our neighbors in need. And sometimes we do see them, but we're afraid. Or we just don't feel like getting involved. So we cross to the other side of the street and we pretend not to see them. I think we've all acted this way at some point and, and we've all felt badly about it. And yet, truth be told, we'll probably do it again. So this parable Jesus tells definitely makes us squirm as it convicts us of our sin. The sin of indifference, of being so self-absorbed that we fail to see and respond to our neighbors in need. Now I just want to say a quick word about what I mean when I use the word sin. Because it's a word that people tend to define in different ways. Now in the original Greek of the New Testament, the word that's used most often for sin is hamartia. It's a word that literally means to miss the mark. So when you and I are you and, when you and I sin, we're <coughs> missing the mark in our relationship with God and with each other. We're breaking relationship and creating a chasm. And each time we sin against someone, the chasm between us and that other person gets deeper and wider and harder. On Wednesday evening, in confirmation class, Kate and the other girls and I delved into the creation story, and I was reminded once again of the amazing good news that we human beings are created in the image of God, whose essence is love, and who desperately desires to be in a loving relationship with each and every one of us. And that's why God sent Jesus into the world, to reveal God's unconditional, undying love for the whole human family, and to bring healing and reconciliation into our lives. Since you and I are created in the image of a loving God, we are made to be in loving relationship with God and with each other. And yet, as we all know, we often miss the mark and break relationship with each other and with God. And this happens all too often. There's money lurking in the shadows, egging us on. <clears throat> Again, I want to be clear that it's not the wealth or the material things themselves that are the problem. The problem lies rather in how we <coughs> regard wealth and in what we do and don't do with it. In today's lesson from 1 Timothy, there's a line that's often misquoted. We hear people say, money is the root of all evil. But what our scripture actually says is, the love of money is a root 